It's the Sunday after Christmas Day, always a strange Sunday in the year, not least this particular year when public worship is again uh, suspended. But it's always strange because people hardly uh, know it's Sunday and uh, are barely recovered from the festivities of Christmas during the preceding days. And so it tends to be not the best attended Sunday and a certain confusion as to what day of the week it is. And then there's a debate as to what you observe on this particular Sunday, because in some Christian traditions, it's the Sunday known as the Sunday uh, dedicated to the Holy Family. Um, we think about the family context into which Jesus was born and what that implies for his upbringing and for our own family life. However, this particular year, I'm going to eschew too much concentration on the Holy Family, important as they are, because you can get into a great debate. One of the great paradoxes is, are the Holy Family poor? Is Jesus born into poverty at the back of an inn, as is often depicted on uh, Christmas cards? And that's a very important piece of, as it were, divine empathy with the poor. On the other hand, showing how the Incarnation can, as it were, affect all layers of society, there's also an argument that notwithstanding how uh, Luke uh, describes the birth, uh, Matthew's account is very different. Uh, Jesus is born in a house, or at least that's where the wise men come to visit him. And there's the, also the issue that Jesus appears educated. Um, uh, Joseph would have been a skilled and respected craftsperson, Jesus was well able to take on the doctors in the temple when he was 12 years old. He seems to have been literate uh, because uh, he was able, as a young adult, to get up in the temple and read the, in the synagogue and read the scrolls. Not many would have been literate in the world at that time. And so there are other issues we could debate about the um, socio-economic background of the Holy Family, and that is taken up to in um, archaeological excavations of what might reputably have been uh, Joseph's business at Nazareth uh, lately. So um, it's all very much in the melting pot. So let's avoid the Holy Family and remember that the 27th of uh, December is one of the three saints' days that follow Christmas. Um, they deliberately follow Christmas one by one. On St. Stephen's Day, the 26th, we remember Stephen, the first martyr, the first to give his life for the faith of Jesus. On the 27th, we remember John, the beloved disciple of the fourth gospel, who was supposed to have been particularly close to Jesus, and not least at the Last Supper. Um, and according to tradition, it was around this beloved disciple that the community which spawned the gospel we call John's Gospel emerged, the community of the beloved disciple. And of course, it's that gospel which doesn't give us the nativity stories, but which gives us a more theological explanation of how the incarnation unfolded. And then on the 28th of December, we have the Holy Innocence Day, when we remember the babies of Bethlehem murdered at the hands of Herod. Uh, strangely, it comes ahead of the Epiphany on the 6th of January, when we remember the visit of the wise men um, and how their encounter with Herod actually brought about the murder. So it's all a bit confusing. But the three holy days after Christmas do follow the nativity for a particular reason. And um, I think when one of them hits a Sunday, it's important to observe them on that day. At least there would be some semblance of a decent congregation, otherwise they tend to be rather neglected. Liturgical purists think that you shouldn't really observe a saint's day on a Sunday. But the Church of Ireland prayer book thinks differently and allows Stephen or uh, John or the Holy Innocents to be marked on the Sunday after Christmas if they hit that day. And I think this makes an important point to the people of God when you hold the meaning of those three saints' days together. Because after all, uh, Stephen is about cost. Uh, John is about how the light shines in the darkness and the darkness never overcomes it. Very important message at this time. And the innocents are about the suffering of children and how they are aligned with the suffering of Christ. And so perhaps it's important to remember that this Christmas and every Christmas, Jesus is born into a world where people like Stephen still suffer for the truth's sake, where, sadly, children are still abused and neglected, and the history of the suffering and abuse of children is a scar, not least on our nation's memory, 
But notwithstanding these things, the light shines in the darkness and always will. And so the three saints' days point out the cost and the message of Christmas to us. And so we think on this day of uh, John, the disciple whom Jesus loved, um, who was reputed, unlike the other disciples, not to have died a martyr's death. That's why we use white rather than red, uniquely among the disciples, as our liturgical color on the Feast of St. John the Evangelist. And on this day we pray in his idiom. Grant, O Lord, we pray, that the word made flesh, proclaimed by your Apostle John, may ever abide and live within us, through Jesus Christ, our incarnate Lord. Amen. And I finish with a verse of an ancient hymn, um, which is very much in the idiom of John himself, uh, written in the early 5th century, probably, and it says this. Of the Father's heart begotten, ere the worlds began to be, he is Alpha, he is Omega, he the source, the ending he, of the things that are, that have been, and of the future years shall see. At his word they were created, he commanded, it was done, heaven and earth and depths of ocean in their threefold order one. All that grows beneath the shining of the light and moon and sun.